Hi, it's Cayman Reynolds, and welcome to tonight's live chat. We have a lot to discuss. There's some crazy things going on in the world of beekeeping. There always is, but this is a little bit more crazy than usual. And as I posted this, there's been a lot of comments. There's been folks saying, hey, I've seen these for years, or we've already got that in Washington, or we've got this, or we've got that. But what this live chat is about is to give you real information on what's going on, and we don't have all the information but we are bringing on an expert, a beekeeper who's dealt with this new problem, at least a new problem for us in the past. And there's some hopeful things and there's some things to be concerned about if things don't go the right way. And if it ends up going that way, what can we do as beekeepers to safeguard our bees? So please join me in welcoming Richard Noel from France. Hi, everybody. Hey, Richard. It's wonderful to see you all again. Yeah, so this is, I think, your third time on uh, my YouTube channel, and it's always a pleasure to have you on, Richard. Thank you for coming. No, you're welcome. It's uh, it's great to be able to kind of be back to help beekeepers again just by giving the little bit that I know, if it if it can help. Uh, it's what it's all about, I'm and sure that's what that community is. We've got people for lots of things, and you come to different people for different things, and hopefully we're going we're gonna to fix this problem. I hope so. And so you were the one that actually told me about this. And I find it interesting because you're, you're way over there across the uh, Atlantic and you're messaging me going, Cayman, Cayman, have you, have you seen this? this? This is not good. We've got this over here. And I was like, it's one of those oh crap moments because it's it's a really big deal. If this sets up shop in the United States, this is a very big deal. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um to give you some idea, we had, well, uh, well, we'll go through a little presentation I've got and we'll identify this insect so people can see it clearly. Now, it's not mm -hmm. the same insect as the giant Japanese hornet, which is called Vespa mandriana, which is also known as the murder hornet. And that's what they had in Washington state. OK, that's completely different. This is the Asian hornet, Vespa um Ven velutina nigrothorax is the is the big name of it okay but you'll see the picture i know it doesn't mean a lot to us but it actually makes a lot of difference when we talk about it and to give you some idea it came into france in a container of pottery uh in 2004 and it's been working the way up france through europe into spain portugal it's now on the doors of germany um and it's just a real pain it's a r real pain but it was all kind of not too bad, not affecting me here much until last year. And last year, it was an absolute nightmare. And there were several reasons why we had it really bad last year, but we'll get to that later on. But this year, Man. I can tell you, it's okay. We're back to where we were, and I cannot, for the life of me, fathom out why. But I've got a couple of pointers, but anyway. Um, if you're happy, we'll do a little bit of a presentation just to go through that. Absolutely. Um, right before you start, um, so this was found in Savannah, Georgia, is from what I understand. Yep. There's there's still, I'm sure, a lot of details that you and I both don't know yet. And as we both find out more about this, I will be sharing that on my platforms, and I imagine Richard will be as well. And so right now, the only thing I know is that it has been confirmed by uh, one of the researchers at the University of Florida, uh, Keith Delaplane, there were some others as well. And so these gentlemen and ladies are, are very uh, skilled in identifying these type of creatures and insects. And so it is confirmed. Um, the story that I've heard is that it was a you know, beekeeper that caught one of them and then sent it in. And then they that's where they identified it. So I guess yeah. the question is... Um, you know how extensive is it, it is so this is savannah georgia not a good location because that's they stay warm very very long down there a lot long season so with that being said richard has the the skinny on the asian hornet and uh richard i'll just turn it over to you okay well let me let me just say that if you get uh an invasive species in any country generally what tends to happen and i only know this from our model is that uh, it tends to rush in and come in massively quickly and just overtake everything. And then it kind of, I wouldn't say naturalizes, but it kind of finds its kind of own, a bit of an equilibrium. The problem with the Asian hornet, it's what we call an ecosystem depressor. It doesn't just take out 
honeybees as such. It takes out pollinators and anything it can find. It will take out spiders out of webs. It will take caterpillars off of trees and shrubs. It will take aphids. It'll, as as the, the year progresses in, in the Asian hornet's life, if it gets hotter and drier, then they start predating things like wasps. So last summer, we had no wasps after August because the Asian hornets ate them all. So this year, I'm actually enjoying it because we haven't got many wasps because there wasn't many nests that finished their life cycle as well. But anyway, I'll run through this little talk. And uh, you then hopefully, if, if anyone wants to ask questions, bring them up. I'll try and hopefully put you in the best picture. It's not good news, but I'll just say this before we start. If it's one nest that has managed to come in a container, a queen that managed to come through in a container, the chances are very positive that they'll track it down and destroy it, and it'll be all done. However, if it's two nests and or, or more, which is unlikely, and then that queen that is in that nest produces more queens at the end of the season and they disperse, that's when the brown stuff will hit the shiny whirly thing next year and everyone will be starting to have major problems. So let me um, try and press the right buttons here. So I'm going to answer a question me. while you're prepping that up. So Garrison Apiary yeah. says, were these released from a university and where would they have come from? So they were not released by a university. They were identified by a university and, and likely, like Richard's talked about, came on a shipping container. Usually that's how we get new exciting creatures and plants uh, is from the uh, shipping products and the imports. Um, but there's still a lot of details to figure out on possibly tracking down what exactly they came in on. So Richard's got some stuff to share and here we go. Okay, so uh, you can see that, can't you, all you guys? It's, it's up and running. I can see it on my end. Brilliant. Okay, great. Well, we're good. Okay, so this is the talk I do for a few groups. I've modified it and stripped the stuff out of me because I want you guys just to have the bare facts. I am a beekeeper in Brittany, France. I'll show you where that is on the map in a minute. If you don't know me, you've just joined. Brittany is part of France. It's a big country. The area we have Asian hornets is now the whole of the country wide. We originally thought that Asian hornets wouldn't do very well up here. Now, I'm not going to get into politics of global warming, but if it is happening, which it looks like it is, we are um, now going to be able to support these Asian hornets better because the weather is more favorable and warmer longer to the end of the year. So bottom middle picture, that's the Asian hornet. And this is where I live on in the, there's the French coast. This isn't the whole of France, but I, what I will show you is also, if you see the UK above, they are now exactly the same problem as uh, America might have. They've got a, 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 at least 12 identified nests on the south coast of the UK. Now, the, the probable reason for this is because in the past, they've had several incursions, but they've only had one or two when things have come in on shipping containers and, and got a lift on a boat over the English Channel there. But what's happened in the spring this year is we had five weeks of easterly winds going from the right to the left. That's north, south, east, west. Okay, So the weather was blowing all these Asian hornets across the UK from Calais there, right at the top, to, mm -hmm. to the UK. And we think that's why they've had a really bad, or they're having a bad year. But they are getting on top of the nest and they're tracking and tracing them. We'll get to that after. But um, for us, we're, we're actually having a really good year. But last year was so bad for us here. There was lots and lots of queens produced all along this coast here, all along here. There was acres and acres, hectares and hectares of forested area that people didn't even know nests existed. And all they did was complete their life cycle and produce queens. So for the UK as well, they're now in a situation where they've got a lot themselves. So um, is this a threat to bees in Brittany? Well, it certainly is for us. And you'll find out why. I did used to say don't panic. But now I still say it. But, I, you know, there is there is way. So don't panic we're going to sort this problem out, but there's no real solution yet. That is the, that is the absolute truth. And if you get an outbreak and it produces queens and they are dispersing, that's when you have problems the following year. Okay, so this is a French, obviously a French slide, French Asiatic um, Asian hornet, about three centimeters, whereas the common hornet, which I do believe you have in America as well, but it's kind of naturalized and it has its place in nature. As much as we might not like it near our hives, it doesn't really catch many hornets. And it's very so, kind of slow. Carry so on, the sorry. one on the right, 
Oh, so the one on the right is the European hornet that we see here in the United States. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's okay. the common European hornet. Yeah. The one that, on the left is, right. is known as the yellow legged hornet. And you can see there they've been referring to it as yellow legged hornet. And there's the yellow legs. The number one ID is the yellow legs. And every time you can identify it through that. So. OK, so maybe just, I'm skipping sorry, ahead. I, no, okay. So the European hornet is bigger in this case. A lot of people are confusing this new one, and I'm getting ahead. I know I am, but so for the that that, that European hornet's quite a bit bigger. It is. But you're gonna you're gonna show us why um, the Asian one is something to be more feared. Um, well, yeah, the the Asian one has several things about it that make it unique, um, and and that's what we're gonna go into. Sorry. Okay, so ignore that word that says nematodes. I'm not sure what I pulled this slide off before, and I was supposed to replace it, but I replaced it with the same one. But that little red dot represents where the Asian hornet came into France in 2004, okay? And it's grown all the way through France ever since then. It's actually much further south now and, and incursion more to the right into Europe. But it's, it's taken a long time, but in the last few years, it's really accelerated. Okay, so this is the murder hornet. This is Vespa mandriana, the giant Japanese hornet, completely different species. This is the worst one of all. This is the one that really will target beehives and they will go in. And this is the one that in Japan, the bees, Apis serrana japonica, I think it is. They've learned how to wait till this hornet goes into the hive and they pounce on it, ball it, cook it to a certain temperature just so that the bees can live, that the hornet dies. So that is your Vespa mandriana or your giant Japanese hornet, the murder hornet. This was the one that was in Washington state. This is the one that we think they've controlled in Washington state. And you saw a lot of publicity about that, but it's not the same as the Asian hornet. Mm. Okay, so this is a little bit about the life cycle. This is exactly the same that would happen if you have an outbreak of hornets, of Asian hornet in America. The life cycle is the same for all Vespers, all the, the wasp family. And they, it varies a little bit, but this is more the Asian hornet. So if you see in January, you get some movement, but basically the females there are overwintering. They're hibernating. They can go down to minus 20, minus 30 without dying. They just can be completely dormant. Um, wow. And then in the spring, they start to forage. So for us here, it's kind of the end of February, March, when we put traps out. Now traps, for these Asian hornets, this is a big thing for us here. The best time we're finding to trap Asian hornets before the before they get going is right when the queens that will make a nest are out foraging because they're hungry, there's not much food, and they're really susceptible because they smell the bait we put out. It's got sugars in it, and we trap a lot. This year, every April I had trapped over 200 queens. So we did a really good oh, job of knocking up loads of queens. It was absolutely <laughs> mental. And I do not jest that for us. That was, as I said in, in, in the introduction, we had a really bad year last year. So we knew that we had a really big job on our hand to get as many nests, sorry, as many queens killed before they start making nests. And it seemed to work because we got our communes involved. We did talks. We did the, at the actual group, our local, um, what do you say, group of communes got together and actually issued people with traps, providing they let people they let the commune know how much they caught. They gave them free traps and it seems to work. And the great thing is, okay, so between kind of end of February, March and the end of May is when the Asian hornet queens fly and the common hornets generally don't, the common hornet queens. So we generally tend to target the only the Asian hornet queens and we're very successful because the other hornets aren't flying. So we're not killing the native hornet. As much as we say, oh, darn things are a pain, we 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 don't tend to get many in the traps till about May because it, April, May time is when the common hornets start to fly. So we have a really good window then for us. That's our little niche, okay? So all this time anyway, right up till June, July, that's when we do our beekeeping. So we could we kind of say, well, it's not too bad because the Asian hornets aren't really doing much. All they're doing is growing their nests in April, May, and June. So yeah, you can say, okay there's not a real big problem in front of my eyes but you start to see a few and that's the misleading thing because in july august and september is when your bees are thinking about making winter bees getting that colony ready and when you are 
preparing things for the winter and that's when the numbers get big and that's when they stress the colonies the biggest problem with asian hornet is stress on the colony because your mm. bees will not move when there's a presence of asian hornets outside the front of it and all of august september and october and into november your bees won't be foraging they won't be bringing food back to the queen she will stop laying and guess what happens your colony dies in february through lack of winter bees that's the big problem you can get away with it most of the time in June and July because it's not too bad. In last year was just unbelievable. So this is a, a friend's doorway. This is like taken years ago, but just bear with me. Look at that little top. This is what the bees, the hornets will do when they make their first primary nest. So all vespers will make a nest, okay? But Asian hornets, I'm, I'm not sure if, if all the vespa do this. They make, but, but, but vespa, uh, the Asian hornet make basically two nests, what we call a starter nest. And this is where the queen on her own will make a little nest somewhere in the behind a shed, in the niche of a tree, under a bit of wood. And she'll even you might have seen me showing you this in one of my um, well looked after hives <laughs> after the winter of loads of dead hives. Um, she even started to make a nest in there, a starter nest. And she is on her own. She's vulnerable because she's got to do all the work herself. She's got to bring in food, make that pulpy nest by scratching the bark off of trees. And then they, they exude it into a small golf ball shape. And she'll raise about 10 to 20 um, workers initially. And then those workers will initially not do too much, but they'll start to forage. And then she will stay in the colony and carry on laying while they take over and do all the work. So it's basically she has to start it all off. So you see, that's the nest. Beautiful thing. It's an amazing creation. Asian hornets are, are, are incredible insects. They're incredibly dynamic. They know what they want. They go and get it, and they just build these nests, you know. And if you look now, you'll see this hopefully will work. There's a giant, sorry, an Asian hornet queen doing her bit before I gave her the two before treatment and ended it all for her. <laughs> so this is a starter <laughs> nest. So let's just get this straight. After about four to six weeks of making the starter nest it grows to the size of what you'd maybe call a baseball or a small football and then they'll abandon that nest and then they'll go and make a nest somewhere else basically in a different food source in the top of a tree in brambles in scrub somewhere where they can be nearer they'll choose it quite carefully but they'll just all uh, travel there migrate en masse and then that's when they'll big their, build their big summer nest so there's the dead um, queen Asian hornet that I killed. You can see the yellow legs there quite clearly. Okay. And you can also see these are the larvae she's been raising. That's the eggs. That's the, this is like the foam I sprayed on the nest, actually. I didn't give it the two before, but I have used a bit of two before, before and it works pretty well if you know she's in the nest. The two by four method uh, works really well. <laughs> it does, yeah. But you've got to be careful because the thing is, if you miss... She's, you're unlikely <laughs> to get stung because it's just her. And she, but she'll be off and she'll do the same somewhere else because there's still enough time for her to make a nest somewhere else. So you're better off using a spray, just a little bit of proper hornet spray you can buy over the counter or a wasp spray, literally one squirt of that and the nest is finished when they're that size. But I'll say this, please don't try and tackle a hornet's nest, a common hornet's nest, unless you're trained or you've got a proper suit to do so because you will find out why you don't do it. Okay, so this is one inside a, uh, this is a small starter nest inside a beehive and over uh, a um, swarm trap I used to put out. And you can see they'll build, they'll hollow it out and build it over the three, three or four frames. And that's a perfect place for them to have food. Often they might find insects coming into the um, like uh, wasps and stuff and they'll just eat them. So it, it's almost like a free, a free place to make a nest. Okay, so this is a, a game we play, Spot the Hornet's Nest. So this is a poplar tree in late summer. They lose their leaves really quickly. So you see this big stuff hanging from the trees. That is mistletoe. And yes, there it is. The Asian Hornet's Nest is right at the top of the tree. So all these people that say, oh, you can find the nest so easily. Well, you might find them, but if you want to treat them with any chemical, how do you get the chemical up to that nest? That's the issue we have. It's, it's still very well people saying, oh, it's great, it's easy. You just track them and trace them. We have a vast area. There's not enough people on the ground, and we cannot do it ourselves. It's a gargantuan task. So 
there's a handsome chap holding a hornet's nest. Um, <laughs> oh boy, I, 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 I gotta, I gotta get off of here. I'll see you later. <laughs> Why is my screen gone blank? Um, That's right. It, you can see this is a, uh, a a typical hornet's nest. This isn't a terrifically big one, but it's still got like five or six layers inside of. Uh, of, of, of brood and queens. We think that was queens being prepared. There's other people now who've studied them, and I'll tell you about the Jersey model in a minute, but they've got much more, or much better, I wouldn't say much more better. They've got much, much better uh, now identifying drones, identifying um, common uh, common hornet workers, and, and also uh, classifying which state of the nest, which part of the nest is which, and where things have been. You know, things have moved on since this. So this is just my findings from where I am. But, you know, uh, this was one that actually my what, one of my ex-beekeeping friends, and sadly he's passed away, that was his workshop, and we were there, and it was just a perfect opportunity to get a photo. But um, it's monstrous. And that that was this nest. Um, I'm going to go back to this one. That was a nest like that in the top of a tree, okay? So I got this photo last week. This is a nest in an not an abandoned house, a house that wasn't being used. It was, um, you can see like the classic kitchen, but the window was open and the Asian hornets had um, used this kitchen as their base. It was right in the middle of a load of houses and they tracked this nest in Jersey, uh, Channel Islands, all the way back to this house, but they had problems they couldn't get in because it was basically locked up and they had to contact the owner. But they eventually got in and they destroyed the nest. But uh, I will give a shout out to John DeCartre. He's one of the big noises in the Jersey Asian Hornet Group, which is responsible for training loads of people because they're right near the French coast, as you saw in my first photo. And Jersey are always getting Asian Hornets before anybody else. So they've learned a lot and they're helping us and we're all working together to try and work out a solution. There is no solution, but we're working on it. So more pictures. Um, you can see there's one nest here. This was in a valley near where I used to have my, another workshop and there's another one up here. This is chestnut trees. You have no idea they're there. You can never find them. They are in the middle of nowhere. And that one is the one that I was holding in the picture after it was cut down. A plum tree that loses its leaves always earlier in the summer. This was, for instance, I think one of the mornings we'd had like a near frost. It was like four or five degrees C and um, the hornets were still flying in and out that nest. So it gives you some idea of the, how diverse they are and how able they are to operate in all conditions. And the, the guy who owned this garden had no idea it was there. And that's often the case. This is a picture taken of two nests much further south from here when the Asian hornets first uh, got going in France. And this is the, this picture, excuse me, has been circulated a lot and you might see it, but it just gives you some idea of the size of nests that you can get under ideal conditions when a new insect invades. So this was one, um, this was an Asian hornet nest right in front of my house. I had no idea it was there till I found it. And um, you can see this on my YouTube channel. Um, it was absolutely monstrous. There's my house in Brittany and there's the nest. Loads of hornets coming and going. They're very quiet. They don't make much noise. But I tell you what, if I'd have touched that nest, they would have just swarmed out and be all over the nest before they went all over me. So there it is. There's to give you some idea of the nest. As I say, it's easy to kill them. It's just getting the treatment to the nest. And they are so well hidden. Very much more concealed in lower scrub now we're seeing and in brambles. Uh, I was only chatting to John DeCartre yesterday in Jersey about the latest ones he'd done. And he sent me that picture of that Asian hornet's nest on the ceiling in that kitchen. And he was telling me how they have finding a lot more now in scrubland and in brambles. And this is their classic place because you imagine the brambles are fortified anyway. So they're protected. Just gives you some idea of the size of things. That's the internal of the nest. I think this nest was also at the nearly at the end of its life cycle, but uh, it's di difficult to difficult tell because I'm not a specialist. This is just what I'm finding and what I've been able to report back on. Hey, so Richard, this was... can I stop you there? Because yeah, I'm sure. curious. And since it's you know my channel, I can, I can ask questions whenever I want, right? So you, you, said, end of its, you said end of its life cycle. What, what do you mean by that? Well, um, at the end of the season... Uh, drones are produced 
just like our bees make drones in the spring and summer, well, they make their drones later in the season and then queens are produced. And then the idea is that drones will go off and mate, I imagine, with other queens from other nests. And that's how the cycle ends. It's the same for all wasps. Incidentally, we did think originally that the Asian hornet wouldn't be a big problem over here because we are, after a genetic analysis, they found that there was only one nest or one queen that founded all the nests in France and Europe. But it's absolutely made no difference. It just shows you how incredibly dynamic these insects are, that all the all the all the daughters, I suppose you call it, have, have produce all these nests all over Europe now, thousands and thousands, if not millions of nests. And it's still one genetic line. And they were honestly thinking it would be weak, it would be inbred, it wouldn't be very functional, it would probably die out. No. So it gives you some idea of the problem. You only need one nest. That's the problem. Wow. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's like, well, I, I'm, I've, I've got pictures as well of what I was dealing with last year. Um, but what, I'll, I'll just carry on a little bit. This was, a, this was yeah. a bee's nest I was called to on top of an oil tank. Okay. So when I got there, I looked in here and went, oh, my God, this was not a bee's nest. So I, I didn't deal with this. I got a specialist treatment person in to deal with this. Um, but these, this hornet was the, it actually, one of them came out and spat venom at me. And I remember it well. I had my veil up. I wasn't stupid, but I had my veil up and I didn't get any venom on it. But they are known for doing it. They can actually spray you with venom. They're not very nice at all. Mm. So uh, they build these amazing nests. They are so incredibly dynamic. I think you'll see in the next few seconds where the nest was actually in. It was in like a, a little lean-to by, by on an oil tank, and that was their access. And they can build anywhere. You see, I mean, uh, that's what you're up against. So back to the life cycle. Uh, just to say that we, we can trap in the spring, which we do, and it's very successful. But we can also trap at the end of the season. So if we have a, if we have a year where we feel that there's been a lot of activity and a lot of hornets, and we think there's going to be a lot of queens produced, we can trap in September, October and in November when these queens are released. And often we don't start to see queens until October, November. So it actually gives us encouragement that if you find a nest late in the season, often you can destroy it and it hasn't produced any queens. So um, you can you can see this tomorrow if you got anyone wants to come and look at the, the live. It will it will come back up tomorrow with this um, map and you'll be able to just get some idea of, of the life cycle. So here's some video of an Asian hornet hawking. And hawking is what we call hovering in front of a beehive. So this is, a, this is the French style beehives we have. I, I run Dadents. Uh, they're all Dadent frames. They're all deep, slightly about another inch deeper than your uh, Langstroth. But what you see here is classic Asian hornet behavior. You'll notice on the top left there, there's clouds of bees or like gobs of bees, you might call it on the front of the landing board. And what they're doing is they're giving a bit of a diversion, we think, to returning bees, so that the returning bees are less likely to get captured by this hornet that is hovering around. So I'll play this video and you can see the hornet will hawk up and down, trying to catch bees as it does, because it's looking for food and that's what it does. So I'll run that one more time. So what this hornet will do, it will capture a bee it will take it to a tree or, or rest on the ground. It will decapitate the bee and leave with a package of protein, a.k.a. the bee's abdomen. It will then take it off to its nest and then use it as protein. So what we do is we, for one of the things we can do is you see these green doors. They've got a, I think it's 5.5 millimeter gap underneath. This one isn't snapped shut. You can see the bottom to the left hand side is a bit of a gap. But what I do is when I make my nukes in the summer, I put all these doors on just so I can say, oh, that one's been had a nuke taken from it. But also that time of year, we tend to get Asian hornets starting badly. So it, my doors are ready in place. So um, but I, there's debate about these doors, you see. I mean, I use these doors. Other people don't. They say that it centralizes the point where the hornets can hunt to one place. OK, and you can uh, I've got, this is an apiary uh, at a client's house a couple of years ago. There's no hornets in front here, but I just put them on a standard because it doesn't really stop the flow of pollen and the flow of nectar, because also at that time of year, it's our dearth. So there's nothing really happening anyway. But this is what you can do. You can have a much wider entrance, but you just make sure that 
um, you've got the same gap at each end. You just use a blocker and you measure the block to make sure it, your front entrance drops down enough to stop the hornets going in. So do hornets, do these um, hornets actually go into hives? Th this is the difference between them, these hornets and the murder hornets or the, um, the, the, the giant Japanese hornet. Generally, Asian hornets won't go into a colony that's still populated with bees. They're just chances, but they're good chances. And they will hang around on the front. And as the colony gets weaker and more um, and less, con oh, what's the word? Uh, well, weaker, they will then start to land on the front more and then they will take bees easier. So if you get, for instance, uh, if you get a colony that tries to requeen and it fails for some reason, say, you know, the queen doesn't return or she gets eaten by an Asian hornet or there's no drones around, that colony becomes queenless as a result of Asian hornets, you could say, and eventually the colony will collapse at the end of the year because there's no queen. So that's what you can do with your nukes. You can do the same with your nukes. We just use that. That's like an overwintering entrance reducer anyway, and it works fine. So this is some Vita Pharma traps that we use at the end of the summer. These are most likely queens. We didn't have them confirmed, but they were released. And they're uh, the way to tell apparently, if you look under a microscope, it's like a bee as well. They're very hairy when they're just emerged, but when they're old workers, they're hairless. So you can see these in the trap. You get loads and loads of them. It's like something from Quater Mass and the Pit. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a scare movie, but that's what we get. And you have to empty these traps out two or three times every week, so they work the best. But uh, that just gives you some idea of what we do and how we trap. So we trap twice a year in the spring to get the queens. We don't really trap in the summer unless we get lots and lots like last year. And then you have to, otherwise you will probably lose most of your colonies. But then if we do get a few that build up through the year, we will trap at the end of the season just to try and mop up as many as we can before they overwinter. So this is a, a, a chap who sent me these pictures. He was in the Loire a couple of years ago and sent me these pictures. This is a homemade bottle trap. Now, if you look on there, you can see he's drilled a hole in there. So the bottle trap is more selective and other insects can get out. But I will just say for the purpose of nature, we do try and have more selective traps these days. OK, <laughs> there's there's another thing I could say that if you were to work out the bycatch that you actually have. It's called bycatch. That means flies, mosquitoes, wasps, anything you want to call it that goes into the trap as well as the hornets. If you worked out how little it actually is in, com in comparison to how many hornets you might kill and, and the good you will do by removing those from the environment in that summer, it's negligible. However, we still must be very careful to maintain that balance okay that's just my opinion but it, that's the truth i'm sorry but the the bycatch is we want to reduce it as much as we can yes we do it's in it's in our interest to reduce it all the time so there you go this was an ancient hornet's nest right close by and at that right time of year this guy trapped something like well you can count them there's over 100 queens there but they literally they will come out of the nest and they will search for sugars so it's a great time for us to mop up queens that have just emerged and there's the nest in the tree and you'd never guess it was there you never would have seen it and uh there <laughs> so I used to use these traps in the spring. I used to use uh, multi-beer white wine and blackcurrant juice, and there's some Asian Hornet Queens. This is a Coke bottle trap. You can see my hand is on the bottom of it. It's an inverted bottle, and I put a funnel thing in the top and make up these traps, but I generally don't use these traps anymore because they're not very selective. So I just want to say that, but it worked at the start, and it did catch a lot of Asian Hornets. And in, in the times when you have loads and loads of hornets, like last year, like we had here, um, you can use these, you can get a bottle, you can put apple cider vinegar in, and they will just literally pour in. You'll catch 100 a day if you get that many at the end of the season. So this is what we use, the Vita Pharma traps. When you get a high infestation, you want to hang them between... Uh, between nukes. This is later in the season. This is like August, September, maybe October time. There is wasps in there. I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, <laughs> make your own mind up. Um, but uh, in the spring, you, you don't really want to hang the traps in front of the hives. You need to put them on shrubs and it's like scatter them around in April, like maybe five or six around in April because they will find the they will find the the traps because they'll home in on the sugar. Whereas in, in later in the year, if you put the, the traps right next to the entrance, you will actually take the pressure off the colony because they'll be always going in the traps. 
there you go vita pharma i'm not a i don't like being slave to a brand but unfortunately these things do work really well that's the attractant i buy uh one bottle and that will bait over a hundred traps so it's pretty good deal and it saves buying loads of bits of beer white wine and um black currant juice which we used to use and who wants to waste white wine and beer i mean let's face it <laughs> so <laughs> okay so um as i said these cattle wires the, the cattle well sorry you know you get these um supports that hold your cattle wire in your ranches and stuff like that we have them over here for cows they're brilliant at actually putting asian hornet traps right where you need them in front of the nest if you get a bad year my friend Terry Hastings worked this out. I know it's only simple, but you go, hang on a minute, that's perfect. Why didn't I think of that years ago? You just push the start, the, the, the spike in the concrete ground, and it works, you know, it, and it's cheap. So there's lots of ways of, of doing it. This is my colleague's way. He, he made up some, some hangers for his traps. Um, so as I said before, Asian hornets cause stress. And it's often at the same time there is a dearth on, okay? So hornets, hunk, hornets hunting or hawking are only one sign of the problem. The biggest issue is the foragers, bees that are not returning with food and messages to the colony. So this is, this is part of the colony is missing. And it's a big part, as we know, the message service is, on, is like temporarily unavailable. Uh, the queen stops laying. Little or no winter bees are made. Huge stresses at a very fragile time. And the colony collapses just like Varroa in probably January, February. And that's what we had this year. And it's very difficult actually to differentiate between is it a Varroa death or a Hornet death? Last year, it was a combination. Just so much stress on our colonies. As I said, there's no winter bees made. So all the old bees that are left don't like having to do the jobs they're supposed to and the colony collapses. I just put that up there so that you get the idea. You know, we need young nurse bees. Hey, Richard. That uh that little the comment the stream that little carry, comment carry on, thing carry. at the bottom uh the stream yep. yard it's on your end can you hit the hide button on that yeah sure no worries i've just ah. i've just ruined the talk have i just ruined the talk ah. yes oh my I gosh what in the world? So, uh, let, let me just start again um sorry that's i should have just let it go but i couldn't see one no. of the parts and i wanted to read it so while uh, you're doing that it says and let me just press this and we try and get back to where i was Oh, you're sure. still sharing. I think you just got to pick which... Am I still which, sharing? Uh, right, I should be able to just... Oh, okay. If I can go back to where I was, where's the... Pressure, or, pressure, or pressure. Can... <laughs> okay. Well, you um, know, we, we have the edit function, Rick, Richard. We'll just edit that part out. Can you do it? Like it never happened. Can you do it? Oh, on my end? Oh, snap. We just lost him, folks. This is great. While we're... Oh, and now for a commercial break. So first of all, I want to say a big thanks to Steve Amos um, early on supporting this yet again. Appreciate you, Steve. Uh, we have a lot going on here. And uh, oh, here he pops in. Uh, we'll get to more questions. We're fixing to do a and a real soon. So here, here's the man of the hour. He's, he's, he's teasing us is what he's doing. Yeah, I've, I've got, I know where we are now. Okay. I know where we are now. It should come back to where I was before. Here we go. Can you see me? Um, I'm not here going we go. to. Yeah, I'm not going to touch that button again. Okay. Because All right. It didn't like. It. Now, the, what I've got to do is I've got to find where I was before, mate. Oh, here we go. Right. Can okay. You see that? All right. I can see that. <laughs> let me, Let me uh, okay. drop this comment okay. real quick. All right. Good. Good to go. Okay. So the question is: Does Asian hornet have any natural predators? Yes, it does. There's one tiny little wasp that you might have seen a video on Instagram and YouTube of someone pulling out a larvae from the back of an Asian hornet. And it looks like the most revolting thing you've ever seen in your life. But that's what this is. This is Conops vesticularis. OK, uh, it's a little wasp, but it doesn't actually produce enough and do enough damage to keep the numbers of uh, hornets down. So there you go. There's the answer. There's no actual predator to Asian hornets. This is the new trap we've got, okay? Not the best picture, but not a bad picture because you can see how it works. Okay, so I'll explain. These two funnel entrances, if you look, they've got a little cap on the end there, and they will allow the Asian hornets to go in, but they can't get out. And at the bottom of this box is a mesh screen that uh, leads to a tray. So the tray is separate, and in the tray we put uh, a bit of honeycomb or ivy honey they love. 
or whatever bait or we, and we we turn to tend to go into proteins later in the year like fish meal and stuff like that that attracts the hornets in the great thing about these traps is they work constantly and you don't need to you don't need to do anything with them apart from check the bait is right because if you open you put a bit of wood across the top and you make sure you have a brick on it because you don't want them to blow over and all your hornets to get out but these fill up really quickly so they're the problem with the other other traps you've seen the vita farmer ones is you need to train them regularly every three or four days and in the summer when it's hot the juice ferments and they're also not very selective so these are the traps we're going over to these work really well i'm using some at the moment the hornets just can't get out and they just die in the traps, but they continually mop up the hornets in your apiary. Okay, so it gives you some idea. They reckon that you should have, if you have a big infestation, two of these in one apiary, and it will really help keep things under control. So uh, there you go. So um, a bit of track and trace, um, how we use methods or methods we use for locating Asian hornet nests. So you've got track and trace, bait and wick stations, they use a compass and a stopwatch to time how long it takes for the hornet to come back because they will come back to the same place. There's some radio tracking starting. That's been done. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And also, believe it or not, there's a bit of work done with dogs too. Because if you imagine you have an Asian hornet nest in a tree, if it's not too high up in the tree, dogs or it's on the ground, dogs can actually find the nest. They home in on the smell because hornets produce a uh a urinal feces at the bottom of the nest and it comes out the base and then you get like a plume that comes out down the tree and the dogs can pick up on it and it's very interesting that that's something they're doing so uh i talked about jersey before this is why jersey has had asian hornets like we've had for a long time uh more so in the last three years the jersey asian hornet group was formed uh and they are doing a terrific job of catching the 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 uh, the nest tracking the nest removing the queens all that every year but the problem is they live close to me which i live about just beneath there bottom left and they live right next to all this coastline which is absolutely full of trees and parks so every year when the wind blows from the east all the asian hornets just blow straight up over back to the island so they're doing a fantastic job but it's like how sustainable is it that we're, they're going to be able to keep mopping up these nests? At the moment, they are up to, they are up to 250 nests removed. It's absolutely frightening. So without them doing that, there I don't know how bad it would be. Okay, so there are a group of, there are a group of people that are more interested in maintaining the biodiversity and the natural environment, and that's what this is all about. It's all about I said before at the start ecosystem depressors, which are constantly weakening all the other insects and food for other animals like um, bats and birds and you know and as i said queens that are returning for flights it, it, everything that in that area will be depressed i i feel a bit embarrassed because i haven't got the actual uh, I, I don't want to tell you a a weight of insects that asian hornets nest will produce will consume every year because i'm going to get it wrong but it's in the kilos it's a huge amount of insects every year that are consumed by one nest so imagine uh, okay, all so, around that area so yeah so kilos mean absolutely nothing to me yeah, so if, if I was to say, if I was to say at least 150 pounds of insects are consumed from one adult asian hornet nest before it dies at that's, least that's that. my body weight that's a lot yeah i know yeah that, yeah, but came and you scary. are. You're not the tallest of guys. <laughs> uh, you know what? You need to get back to your presentation, Richard. You had more to say, yeah, didn't okay. you? You're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is some examples of uh, the wick stations we use. You have a, a liquid. Uh, there's a well-known liquid they use. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me, but it's one of the wasp attractant liquids they use, and it soaks up in the wick, and then the agent on it comes along, and you can actually tag it. Um, I will say also, I've got to mention Alistair Christie, who's the States of Jersey, Asian Hornet coordinator, and he oversees it all and works with um, Bob Hogg and uh, and all the other members who I've mentioned before, um, and John DeCartre, all, all have got this fantastic team. And I do, I, I believe that um, th there's been some people from America within the, the, um, uh, the, the current outbreak already chatting to Jersey, which is just fantastic. And they're finding out the best ways to track and trace, which is what it's all about, sharing and communicating. So there's the main horn, Asian Hornet tagged like um, we do our queens. And uh, um, that will then fly off to the nest and I'll time it and track it and come back and uh, work out. So radio tracking, this is in its infancy, but it's been done. Uh, 
they basically catch the Asian hornet and put a little transmitter on it and it will fly back to the tree. There's other other methods you see people catching the hornets and tying a little bit of like light tinsel around the around the hornet and they can see more easily which direction it goes off. But it just takes time. This will actually take you straight to the nest. The problem is Asian hornets can have quite a long distance in their foraging radius and you might have to use a few of these radio transceivers to get to actually where the nest is but it works but it's it's in its infancy that the, the problem is as i said with that radio transmitter it's not that strong and they're looking at finding better ways or better tracking methods with radio waves but it, it's 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 very expensive to do this if you can imagine to set it all up that's the asian hornet ready to be released Peter Kennedy from Exeter University was over in Jersey, I think recently, but they do correspond a lot and they've done a lot of work. So America has a big helping hand in all this experience trying to track Asian hornets. So it's, um, uh, as I said, I mentioned the tracker dogs, I won't read that, but there you go. There was the nest up in the tree they found because they honed in on the smell. It's just something to bear in mind. There's another kind of that's in weird- That's incredible. Side. It is you know, what dogs, I mean, sniffer dogs are amazing, as we know. They can even sniff out um, European foul brood. So, you know, put them to work, you know. So, um, <laughs> I, Jersey I has lots of resources. <laughs> this is what we don't have in Jersey. We don't have, sorry, what we don't have in France. We have this, but it's just inaffordable. And the terrain we have is inaccessible. Uh, in Jersey, there's more resources. There's more people. It's all about the area where you have an invasion of how populated it is and how many foot soldiers there is on the ground. That's the key. That's why the UK might track down all the nests before later in the summer, and they may well capture all the nests, and then they can put traps out next spring in case they miss one or two. But there's a good chance they will be able to keep their outbreak under control. I'm pretty sure, though, that America will do the same if they can find that one nest, because it will not produce queens. So I, I wrote this down. This is some facts about Asian hornets in France. They're still keeping bees in the Gironde area of France, where Asian hornets first came in. OK. But it's not easy, but they're still doing it. We in Brittany are right on the north coast of France, where I said just before I thought it was cooler and it may inhibit the early growth of nests because we do get cold springs. Some years are worse than others, like last year. In the United Kingdom, nests have been eradicated, as I've said, because of well-paced resources and plenty of foot soldiers. And I don't think the Asian horns will ever pose a serious threat to honeybees in the UK if the current level of alert is maintained. But I'm going to eat my words and say we will see. Because this last year was exceptional. Now they're dealing with the aftermath of last year's Asian hornets here. There's an Asian hornet handbook by Sarah Bunker. She's wrote it specifically about this beast. Um, it's a really good book and it's it's quite a biological kind of level. So it's very interesting about what how amazingly dynamic these creatures are. Um, and thank you for your time. <laughs> Wow, that was really great, Richard. I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, this is something that you know we've talked about in the past, you and I, and hoping that this day would never come. But that's the advantage of this YouTube community and using social media. Because if this does become a problem, the beekeepers over in your region have already figured out a lot of processes and techniques to be able to at least protect the bees better and be able to manage mm -hmm. bees better. But I hope that you're right, that this was just brought in recently, maybe you know, late spring if we're lucky, and th there's a, just a nest or something like that, and they can mop it up. And, you know, if it's how, – how good do you think the chances are if it's confined to, like, two to three nests in one county? Um, I would say it's unlikely to be even two or three nests. It's more than likely to be one nest. But it, it depends, you see. I mean, I was speaking to a beekeeper the other day, and, that, and they were saying, well, I'm sure we've had these already. But I don't know if that's true, because a lot of people report seeing hornets, excuse me, and there's not actually hornets. There's other things that are like hornets. You get one called a hornet, a hornet a mimic fly, which is quite a big light colored fly there's other ones which are a wasp type which have got a very long tail i can't remember the name um 
But even if it was three nests, okay, that they suddenly discovered, if they know what they need to throw at it, they can easily sort it out. But they've got one chance, one chance. And unfortunately, uh, and everyone in France will agree with me, they had the chance in France and they didn't throw everything at it. They could have literally, I know it sounds crazy, but think of this. If you deforested an area of, I don't know, a thousand hectares, just to say, right, we'll do that once and then we'll replant it in a year's time or we'll just make sure we check everything. What I'm saying is that be that, be that strict once because then you've got it. But now Italy, Spain, France, the whole of Europe, of all our beekeeping friends are all chafing at the bit because they got this pest and they're just like saying, why didn't they just do something when they had the chance? And they didn't. And that's the most frustrating thing. We've got Varroa. You've got some more high beetle and Varroa. If you have Asian Hornet, you might just as well <laughs> hang up your hive tool because it just becomes... Uh... We, don't, we don't have a high beetle yet. That's the other side of the Alps for us at the moment. But it can stay there, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, and so thankfully we have an example of things being done right what they did in washington with the, yeah, the japanese hornet and you say the technical name for it is what manda uh, mandriana vespa mandriana, mandriana the giant japanese hornet if you want to look at what uh, the bees do in japan just just put in vespa mandriana but then or uh, sorry it's vespa, um yeah vespa mandriana but it's um it's the japanese one and in japan the, the bees will actually wait until the hornet enters the hive and then they'll pounce on it where um the asian hornet here doesn't even land on the hive it doesn't it captures all its air, bees in the air so it'll 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 you saw it hovering in front of a hive and it'll grab a bee and then it literally then it'll struggle to to find a tree to just drop onto while it decapitates the bee and then it'll fly after its nest with that little protein package and uh th that's often what you see i mean I, I just wish I'd included some of the pictures that I should have put in because I modified that today to try and make it a little bit less tiresome of pictures of where I live and all that. And just to show you the bare facts, but I should have just had a few pics in that was good. Um, of the actual more of the hawking in front, but we can post them another time. But, uh, exactly. Uh, well, and people, I... Sorry, just so the main thing is learn the yellow legs. And if you remember yellow legs, there is an app that the British Beekeeping Association have got. I don't know if it's worldwide, but they use an app to um, help identify this pest. And it's become a really useful tool because on the app, you just click, you take a photo of it. You think, yeah, that's it. You, you get a photo if you can. You send it straight off and there's someone there, a bee inspector around pretty quick. So they've got good resources. That's what I hope America will do. So you know, you were mentioning earlier and there's been some questions and I think, well, let me say before that, because i got to thank some people. I want to say a big thank you to Terry Chapman. Thanks very much. Um, this is the fellow who has the Guardian Bee Apparel, the bee suits and stuff like that. He's not too far at all from Savannah, Georgia, and that was where they have spotted this. And there's a lot of imports in that region just because it's, you know, the Atlantic. And so yeah. you know, they're bringing stuff in, and that's how these bugs and various things get brought in is, you know, all it takes is at one queen – and it happens. So thanks, Terry. We're going to use that toward the getting Richard Noel into the promised land of uh, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> well, I don't know if Kentucky's ever been described as the promised land, but it's the bluegrass state. So I'll get the banjos out for you. And I want to say a big thank you to JC Apiary and once again, Mr. Dave Dwyer and Steve Amos as well. And we got some questions to get to Richard. So, uh, a lady was asking earlier, um, all right, is our climate conducive to their survival or are they adaptive? So what, what do you think, realistically, if you're looking at Canada, northern United States, where they can even get areas that will get like in you know the Dakotas and Montana where you're dropping down to negative 30, negative 40 every year, kind of what do you think, based on what you know, they're going to be at a uh, range? I, I would say – I wouldn't say they would probably do well at, at minus 30, minus 40. So I think Ian Stepler's probably okay. Um, but never say never. But, what I will say right. is in the temperate climate, in, 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 a, in, in that band across the Central America and Florida, it will go nuts there. You know, it, anywhere where it's warmer rather than bitter cold, it will do okay. But you, you can look up 
or I'm sure you can Google up um, or whatever search engine you want to use, but you can look up these insects and find out their general climate zone, but put them in a different environment and often they still do okay. Um, what we would hope was the fact that we have wet winters, it seems to make no difference at all. If they're there yeah, and exactly. there's enough of them overwintering, they will try and make a presence. That's the problem. So based off of what it, little in, I know. In the, UK, in the UK, there doesn't seem to be any further north of like mid UK at the moment. There's not many been any outbreaks mm -hmm. or insects making it there. So I, I would say it's not that cold up there, but it's just maybe the climate's just not very good. And the, the, as I said, the key thing is when they start in the spring, they like to get away as early as they can. So if they can start early, they will. And that's why where we are is perfect for them. But for instance, uh, you've got the Blue Ridge Mountains, you know, like in is it southern Georgia there. All the area is what I'm talking about was the vastness. These nests go unchecked. So even if they're not that successful, as long as they make it to the end of their life. So, you know, sometimes you get a small wasp nest and a big wasp nest. They both produce right. queens. That's what I'm saying. So they, they can be successful, but just not as prolific in some areas, but they will still live. Right. They'll, they'll, they'll still be a factor. And so yeah. the question we had earlier as well was, you know, based off of what you've seen as far as them sweeping across France, and there's no way to predict this accurately because we we have areas that are further south than France, but, you know, how fast did they sweep through France? You know, if this did, you know, colonize itself in Georgia, you know, what kind of time, if they really take over, what would you well, say? Well, um, Asian hornets came into France 2004. I didn't see any even when I've been beekeeping until like 2012, 2013, when I started kind of monitoring a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say it will take quite a while, but in kilometers, they are said to kind of spread 60, 70, maybe 80 kilometers in a year. That's the kind of range they could go. But if you get a wind behind you, like persistent jet stream or something, they may go further. Um, so they, they'll take, sure. it won't be like, and, it, and as I said, this is to our advantage a little bit because if we if you find a nest over, over winter and you go, oh my God, there's a hornet's nest, it's probably produced queens and they analyze it and yes, it's been a normal nest. Um, you could put traps all around in a radius and you'll do a pretty good job of mopping up the queens in the spring. So, so that's an encouraging it, thing. It is, and that's it's exciting to know that you guys have tried a bunch of things out and you're finding what works better whether it's a homemade trap that's better than the others or if it's a, a trap from vita pharma it, that's specifically designed for this uh, hornet so austin Payne has a yeah. question for you do the traps um, attract and kill honeybees as well no they don't they are the bait we use doesn't really attract honeybees at all i've seen a few honeybees in a trap but it's often you know when you get like a robbing frenzy or something Bees will just kind of land on anything and a few get stuck in, but they, they, you don't get piles of bees in the traps. That's the great thing. You only get um, some bycatch. Uh, but I will also say that in the bad year last year, there was no bycatch. It was just pure hornets. That picture you posted on the background of the live chat showing just that mm -hmm. pile of hornets, that's what we were getting. No, no other insects. There were some common hornets in it as well, but it was also a very good year for the common hornet, unfortunately. So we did end up with a few of those, but we had to trap. Because it was just the mm. intensity was so much, we had to try and de, like, depressurize the area to keep our bees alive. Um, so, so did you um, did you know where that photo I got came from, Richard? Uh, it may have been one of mine. On I don't know. Maybe yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, what what picture can I use? I'm in a hurry. I'm fixing to fly to South Dakota, and I'm like, you know what? I know Richard well enough. I'm going to go on his YouTube channel, find a decent picture, and I'm just going to pirate that picture. <laughs> it it and, wasn't uh, that great. I mean, I, it, it's like everything else. If you're organized, which I, I'm not at the moment, um, I've just been out feeding bees this evening. I'm rushed back in and trying to get everything organized. But um, we're all doing the same. A beekeeper's life is a, a busy one. Um, in you know, Going into the winter, I've got more time. We'll get some better slides done. But I want people just to have an idea of uh, what they could be up against but it's so important i can't get the message over enough if, if you've got one chance and you can throw resources at it please do so please get people involved and also uh, another thing especially the jersey model a lot of people who aren't really beekeepers have got involved because they they care about the environment and they know that what damage these insects will do because they're so voracious mm -hmm. and they they literally are ecosystem depressors which means they take food out of the environment so they take the natural food away and 
you will see uh, you will see a, a dip in you know birds raising young and stuff like that. You know, they might only do one one clutch in the spring. All those little things. It's it's not something we notice every day. And unfortunately, a lot of people who don't aren't out hiking or they don't take advantage of nature. Let's just put it like that. To them, it doesn't mean anything. But to us, it's an absolute catastrophe. You know, catastrophe. It, it it's just, like a, just catastrophe. you're right. You're, you're you're, ta- you're taking away you know food for birds. You're taking food away from other uh, insect predators that are native, and it, it in, it's way more than just honeybees. Uh, honey, obviously, honeybees matter to you and I quite a bit because we're beekeepers, and that's the first and foremost th- foremost thought. But if it if it's robbing food sources from birds, um, that's impacting their life cycle and how many of them are going to be able to be successful every year and if something depends on those birds for a food source then that impacts the predators of those birds and it just Mm. i mean that's like so the american chestnut tree yeah you know we have we used to have the american chestnut tree and they were just all over this region some people said you know 20 to 30 percent of the trees and these were just massive giant trees that produce chestnuts and whenever those got the the disease that took them out it impacted everything the whole food chain because those chestnuts fed so mm. many animals that in turn fed predators and it just a whole animal population I think it's the, the, the terminology is what you call a, a, a trophic cascade it basically one effect at the top of the of the system like a source of food that's very specific to a lot of animals when it's missing it, it affects so much underneath in different ways and it takes a long time to adjust um, but uh, let me just say, uh, I'll give you some good news. So this year, um, we still haven't got very many hornets. Some apiaries have none. And I, I can't understand why. I think it was because the wind we had blew them all over to Jersey and the UK, because <laughs> it was literally five weeks of strong easterly winds. And they had a, these Asian hornets had a hard time. So we are back to what we were a couple of years ago. So I've, I have bees this year that have done really well. I've recovered from my losses. I've made lots of splits. I've got a little bit of honey that I'm harvesting now. And I've got loads of colonies for next year and to go into the winter with. And the bees are happy. They're not, you know, doing much now because it's the dearth. Um, I'm caging queens and releasing them and treating oxalic acid. But all the usual things, everything is kind of status quo. So it's good. So. I will also assure people that sometimes it can be it can seem horrendous and then a year later it's a different thing altogether mm-hmm. it is a that's bit what, cyclical as well that's yeah i agree and so that's what, what we see with small hive beetles there will be some years where they're just bonkers and they're just all over the place and there's some years where they're not and i usually uh, relate that to a harder winter because they don't do as well with a harder winter. But Tennessee, we can have a very mild winter. And then sometimes if we just have a good week of cold winter weather, that's unusual for us. Mm-hmm. That really impacts the next season. And, and there's other things that I've seen before where we've had some unusually late s- freezes in spring. And I hate it when we get those because it's terrible for the nectar and pollen flow. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it really pops the the small hive beetles and so there, there's a lot of variables in mother nature but uh you know there's there's several questions down here there's some people that have come on late and one of them um, says a wonderful presentation i totally agree that was really well done richard um thanks for uh, offering to come on last minute because this is recent news and like i've said before i've had a lot of people email me go hey i've been seeing these for years 99.9% of the time, there's going to be your European hornets. We see those every year. This is a totally different animal, so to speak. It's They they are much more voracious. And, I'll, and I'll just, I'll just comment on that, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just give an example. If you have a, a, a common hornet's nest, okay, and an Asian hornet's nest, and you disturb a common hornet's nest, you are pretty unlucky if you get stung, okay? Because you go, oh, off you go. You walk away, leave it alone. Don't want, to, don't want to mess with that. If you disturb an Asian's hornet's nest, they will pour out and they will be all over you. And that's the problem. It's not that they specifically have any stronger venom. It's just they are more ferocious and more dynamic in the way they attack. They're just very, very smart insects. So if you mm. find an Asian hornet's nest, you will know about it because the hornets will find you before you find the nest. <laughs> just to let you know. I mean, that's the problem. I've had several stings, two in my head, 
and that really hurt. But I'm luckily not very allergic to um, to bee venom, or as it turns out, I know Asian hornet venom, and hornet venom is different. But I've seen pictures of people that have been attacked, and it, some people their skin literally rots where they get. Ew. It's just they they are literally very allergic to it, and it's not good news. Yeah. So so people who are normally allergic to bees and wasps are more likely to die from these guys because they're going to get stung more just because of the habit of the hornet if that makes sense mm. whereas they were makes unlikely sense. to die from the common hornet because it's just they've got a half a sting and then they managed to get out quick and you see what i'm saying it's just that little bit more of a degree of intensity with these critters they really are a nightmare do they produce more nests like we don't see i mean i do see some european hornets we see other types of native hornets here but we don't see tons and tons of them they don't get as big of nests either uh, do you see where these things are building more nests on top of each other versus other types of species oh no no the for first of all they they never use the same nest twice one year is an annual cycle with all vespa colonies okay, okay. but what you'll see is they might in in some wasps nests and maybe hornet nests, they'll have a place that is favorable favorable for them to build like in an attic or something. And it might look like they're using an old nest, but they're just right. Uh, a guy in, uh, who I know does a lot of cutouts found, I think, four wasps nests in the same area last week. And one was like huge. But it's it just because it's, it's like they're not building on the same nest. They always make a new nest every year. Because what it is, they make it by scraping um, ash trees, poplar trees, they scrape the bark off that and then they put it in their jaws and chew it and they make it into a like a, a paste and it's that paste that they, they kind of squeeze out again and make these amazing nests. But it doesn't last long, this nest. It's just enough to get them into the season. I mean, it's like all that work. You, you were saying, like, well, why bother all that work just to produce some miserable hornets that we all hate and then you die at the end of it? You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> what's the point? But it's what they do and they're good at it, you know? Um but, it really is. Uh, it's kind of like small hive beetles. It's very impressive. If they weren't so damaging, they would be a, a fascinating insect to observe. And uh, the Asian hornets the same. When you look at them, they're very clean. They're very dynamic. They're incredibly able to, to diversify where they wherever they are. So Austin Payne has a question. You answered this earlier, but can oh he says can you link to the commercial. Uh, murder hornet trap and, and bait y'all were talking about earlier and so that trap is made by Vita Pharma I actually it talked is. to them right after I found about this because uh, some of them didn't know and it was just so, so recently off the press and um, you know you got to me that that day and then I got to them right right after you got off the phone with me because I had just talked to Vita Pharma uh, right before and they make the Vespa catch but it's not uh, it hasn't gone through the rounds of like the EPA and stuff here, so it's not for sale in the United States at this point. Now, I wonder if they find that it's not one nest, but there's a decent bit of them in this region of Georgia, if they're going to be able to get some type of like emergency, like yeah, help send resources. Important. Yeah, I, I'm sure there must be a temporary license they could uh, grant to allow that. You know, it's, it's what you call um, um, like an emergency procedure. I would say there must be emergency insect incursions they have in law that they can use certain legislation like they do anyway in the government. Let's face it, if there's something they want to do, they'll do it anyway. So <laughs> um, there must be something they can right. use. I'm sure they will. You know, um, I'm sure they will uh, be able to get some. Uh, uh, you, I mean, you, you can make some traps anyway that work well. But obviously, it's ideal to have the ones that we know work best because then you've got more chance of uh getting the target insect you don't want to be trapping other things so roy has a question for you and i didn't know if there was a site of four asian hornets or just like general information now if, if roy is referring to what's recently gone down here in the united states you can google that pretty easily right now a lot of it's just early reporting it's like hey we've discovered it this We've sent it to these professional like entomologists and they have confirmed this has been spotted here in the U.S. I have not received any updates. We're looking for those to see how extensive they are. And it's, you know, it's probably going to take a little mm. bit of time as they put traps out and you know catch yeah. some of these yeah. and see. So yeah, as, as, as we learn stuff, we will definitely be sharing it. But, you know, Richard, is there a great site to read more about the Asian hornet? You've given us great information. I hope anyone that's come on late... We'll, we'll go through this because 
Uh, Richard goes for about 40 minutes on what I thought was as good as any presentation I've had uh, on here um, because this is – and that's one of the reasons I wanted you to come on is because you deal with this, and you've dealt with this for a while, and so we're beekeepers. We want to hear how a beekeeper's point of view is, is on this, and, and you did great. Um, you know, n- maybe – maybe you'll help us out, and hopefully hopefully we won't need your advice, Richard. I really hope that this gets crushed, and I'm, we don't I'm, need any I'm of it. Sure, I, I'm pretty sure that you'll be okay. If, if, if it sounds like what it is, it's like – that's about the best case scenario at the moment. If it is just some insects identified, it, it's un, it, you know, with shipping containers, it's unlikely it's more than one. It could be, but you know, why wasn't there more before? It's probably only one nest at the moment somewhere that they will track down. Um, I, I can't say I'm not, a, you know, I don't have a, a crystal ball. Crystal ball. But, <laughs> yeah. But, with the way it works, it's more than likely one nest at the moment. But we we just don't know. We can't. Um, what's the what's the word? You you can't assume because you make an ass out of you and me. Um, that's the word I think. So we can't assume. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I don't need any help with that either. And so <laughs> I'm good at that as oh, well. <laughs> right. That might, maybe it comes with being a beekeeper. I don't know. But so, yeah. um, do you? You know, what we'll do is when we're finished with this talk um, and this is released into a video that people can just watch and rewatch, I'm going to put down in the comments and in the description of the video any links or any information that you want to give me, Richard. Is there any websites or things that you, you kind of got off the top of your head, though, for Roy? Yeah, I, I, I have got a few, but there's, um, uh, there's also a Facebook group, the Jersey Asian Hornet Group. They're worldwide. They've got loads of followers, and there's absolutely brilliant pictures on that. John DeCartrip posts on there regularly. He's really up to date with it, and they've done a fantastic job, you know, of what they do. They know that they know more about these hornets. They've got a team behind them than anybody probably anywhere in the world, probably more than they do where they first originated from in Asia. They are that good, you know. I, I feel like... <laughs> Um, like the schoolboy here, just kind of repeating what I've been told. It's, but I, I will say uh, another thing. Last year, I was so deflated that I, as you know, I've, I've done a new build here. I just buried myself in my building, and that's what that's what got me through the Asian Hornet problem because I was so low after having to deal with all of that. But I felt that it's like a journey, like a lot of these things are, and I've come out of it. And now I've rebuilt from it, and it proves it can be done. So. Uh, we'll also say as well that I have got other videos on my YouTube channel with Asian Hornets in and other pictures, but we will get some links to uh, stuff. It'd be nice if I could just post a load of my pictures and people could just view them um, and then have some idea of the, and some videos. Yeah. So I've got clips of Hornets hawking and stuff and um, maybe I could just do that as a YouTube video yeah, and then anyone can just do that, uh, and then I can just log in and see, it, and I could just do the video of all the clips that I've got, and just so people have some idea what they're up against. That would be a good thing yeah. to do. Yeah, if you end up doing that, just let me know, and I'll share it on my platforms, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I'm actually posting right now the uh, in into the comments the Asian Hornet group on Facebook, the Jersey uh, group. So if you want to, you know, see what they're doing over there and how they're you know, showing the nest or dealing with nests and different things like that. That'll be interesting. Uh, what was that book? There's a gentleman on here by the name of well, it's Keith. A Sarah Bunker, the Asian Hornet book. It's called Sarah Bunker. Like we can put the link to that as well. Um, yeah. yeah, that's no problem. Yeah. It's actually, uh, it's, since it's, it's becoming more and more kind of people are going back to it now, it's becoming quite a well kind of thought after book. It's well researched. It's really good. And so here's a question from 611. And I, I think it's a pretty clear-cut answer. You know, do Asian hornets affect other pollinators or just honeybees? Um, originally, okay, that's a, it's an interesting question, and it's, and it's good to just clarify this. Originally, it was thought to be mis- mostly a honeybee issue, but now we know so much more that it's it's all pollinators. It, it's mostly insects as well. I mean, aphids, caterpillars, spiders, um, just about any insect that you can you can assimilate to be protein, hornets will eat. Okay, I didn't say this as well. Last summer, they did a, I said we had hardly any wasps this year because the hornets ate them all. So they did a gut analysis of the Asian hornet in August. There's data I can post of that as well that proves oh. it. It was a genetic a genetic level. There was nothing else for them to eat. So the Asian hornets then moved on to the wasps. 
that's why we had no wasps. The wasps, we had a terrible year for wasps, but after August, they all disappeared, you know? And another thing, right, this is how bad it was. I had, uh, in my apiary, I had a, 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 a two stack of, um, a two stack high with two, two supers on it that fell over. No robbing. You know why? The bees didn't come out because they were so petrified. That's how bad it was. I've never had that in my life. Now I go to an apiary and things are robbing still. They're back to their usual habits, you know. That's mm -hmm. the problem, the stress it causes on the colonies. Bees just don't go out. That's, that's wild. And i got to say a big thank you to Paul Martins yet again for coming on. And we're looking forward to seeing you in January. Richard Noel is going to be there with us. And that is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and obviously, we hope by then we're going to get the news that, hey, this is history. This isn't in the you, U.S. You anymore. <laughs> yeah, we'll just say we'll be able to just save a lot of money and say, Richard, stay home. Um, no, we're not going to do you that way. So if, hopefully um, you, you'll be able to ask him a lot of questions about whatever you want. And you won't have to ask about Asian Hornets because they'll have already crushed them. But, you know, realistically, we hope, um, we hope you know, so. Time will tell, but that'll be a lot of fun. And I actually just got word from Marla Spivak that she is going to be joining us as well. And so I'm really excited. She'll be giving a presentation yeah. on different types of bees that they're breeding for varroa resistance and also of propolis. She's very well known for research and her team, uh, some of the foremost people in this region of the world on propolis and its effects on bees and pathogens and disease in the hive. And so I, I actually was able to hear a presentation from her recently. It was, it was very good. So going to have her and, you know, no pressure, Richard. You're just going to have to perform at a, a higher level, you know. <laughs> no, no pressure at all. Eh? No pressure whatsoever. Oh, this, it's only like 140 days. Sorry, to just say, this is the great thing about this is um, I, I never, ever – I, I wish one thing I if you know people do New Year's resolutions, one of the news resolutions I wish I could do was to become more scientific in my approach. But it's so difficult when you're a beekeeper and you've got two hundred colonies to look after because you end up just having to do the best thing to get through that task. And when you speak to all these people who are way, way above my kind of level, the, the information they can give you as a as that boost is is incredible. You know, there's just so much out there to learn. You know, so many topics, so many things. You know, um, unhealthy brood odor we're talking about now. Um, you yeah. know, Corey's going through that as well. And it's just, it's epic, the amount of things uh, that are, you know. So my like, my so wife's given me... All oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, my wife's given me instructions over here, and I really care okay. about you, Richard, but on the scale of Laurel's <laughs> importance I'm, I'm and your sad, importance, yeah. you're, you're barely on the radar, okay? Oh. Uh, yeah, she's over here giving me cues, and I'm just like, "Am I going to get this one right? Am I, you know, am I doing? Am I, am I yeah, understanding no, her? She's get. I feel like been, a baseball player. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, thanks. It's been great to be able to hopefully give an insight as to what I do, what I've had to deal with, and now where I am now, and to give you that bit of hope because I don't like to leave on a negative note, but I'm also extremely realistic, and it's just that thought that hopefully people can communicate and work together and deal with this problem, just like they did in Washington state. I mean, you know, yeah. it's proof they can do it. And that was a, that would have been a nightmare if that, if that got loose. Um, Having both of them. Oh my goodness. Could you imagine if both of these would have, that would have been an interesting experience. Um, I, I speak but, to a beekeeper in Japan and he's got f three types of hornets there, common giant Japanese and the Asian. And his bees never live. <laughs> they always end up succumbing to the hornets at the end of the year. But it's different. They they do things differently there. So, well, see if if we could do things the uh, the redneck way, I, we could we could take care of this situation right now. What we would do is say, yeah. look, they're in this region and they're trying to make a westward expansion. But for every redneck that will bring us a hornet's nest, that's a, that's an Asian hornet or whatever, we're, we're going to give you. Twelve dollars, thousand bucks would be worth every penny. Honestly, it would be worth every penny. But these are rednecks, so they'll, they'll do it for twelve bucks. Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, you so it, if you make it really expensive, I tell you, you will have Asian nest hornet hornet nest turning up on your doorstep the next morning. <laughs> that's right. 
they'll be like, uh, yeah, they're, they're giving $15 and a, a case of beer. We have everybody in Arkansas with a shotgun over in <laughs> Georgia. And then the Georgia rednecks would be trying to kick them out, going, no, 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 this is our territory. And it'd be over in 10 days. Um, it would be, yeah. You, you know, por- of course, there'd be cases of people getting bird shot pulled out of their backside. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know, all jokes aside, um, what they did in Washington was exceptional. Most of the time when something like this hits a new country, the reaction time is very slow. And by the time you realize what's going on, it's it's too late. It's already got a, too big mm-hmm. of a foothold. And they were able to recognize the problem and then actually act fast. So, you know, anybody that was a part of that program you know, they just have 100 percent of my respect because that typically doesn't work out that good and that was awesome well the, the thing is with the, as i said the giant japanese hornet is they they're not like a problem where you might have a hive that will suffer the hive will be dead they will decimate it when they find it within 20 minutes half an hour it'll be it'll be dead um whereas the asian hornet you've got a bit more a bit more flexibility with it not that it's you know not that you don't want it you don't want any of them but th- that's the worst case scenario those the giant i've seen some video um of the giant japanese hornet nest and they get the size of a sofa like thousands of workers really big and you see these guys they wear the same so you've probably seen the suits the washington state technicians had these they sort of look like you know um spacemen but they're totally sting proof suits and they spend like hours literally bagging up these hornets into cages because they actually eat them they take them away in deep fry yeah them. it was a delicacy yeah they do look they well, everyone I mean, eats locusts without protein well <sighs> you know Crazy. you uh, more power to them as long as i don't have to uh partake I, i'm okay uh Terry's like, yeah, we got it. Bring the cash and the beer. Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I told you it doesn't take much. I mean, they did that with some of the other other stuff, like down in the swamps. We have the the Nutra. It's it's a big swamp rat, and it was causing okay. a, and it still is causing a lot of damage to the uh, native grasses and kind of the habitats. And so, for every tail you bring back, uh, they'll give you X amount of dollars. And so. Uh, got you know, guys and gals will go down there and, and just shoot the fire out of them and, and help keep them under control. And uh, any excuse to get on a boat and shoot a gun in the, in some parts of the, the United States. But um, I, I hear that some people are even finding ways to cook those rats. Um, again, no thank you. You just have, you have the rats, and then you have a side of the pupa from those Japanese hornets, and there you got yourself a full-blown healthy meal right there. Packed full of protein, Cayman. Totally packed full of protein. So I want to say a big thank you to David Hunter. It's very generous of you. Everyone's been very generous tonight, and um, we're just going to have to have a really nice care package for um, Richard Noel when he makes uh, another U.S. landfall and and visits us in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, in January. So we'll have to show him some southern hospitality. So that means you're going to gain about nine pounds of weight, Richard, after if we get done like, with you. If it's anything like the last hospitality i'll be more than blown over with that it was fantastic the last trip over so um you know i even got picked up from the airport i didn't have to wait everywhere i was like hello and like just there it was fantastic you know oh yeah i well heard organized. that we there well thank you i heard that there was a problem though um and that someone introduced you to mocha frappuccinos yeah and... unfortunately yeah <laughs> which bit yeah. do you want me to pinch <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i figured you know, over there, you know, you needed you need to come over here and experience the the, the crazy stuff that we do and the, the huge sizes of beverages that they'll give that, you. That's the problem. I, I bought several mocha frappuccinos in in the UK and they're like baby size. I'm like, this is nothing. You know, it's just that's, and it's the same price. <laughs> that's right. Well, the way we look at it over here, you only live once, and so um, <laughs> this is terrible because I. And people who don't watch my videos a lot, they really have to take a lot of this with a little tongue. In, it's a little tongue in cheek because I grow a garden. I like to eat pretty healthy. I, I don't get too extreme with it, though. You know, my kids still eat ice cream and 
and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's a balance to it. But I'll, I'll tease and joke about all kinds of stuff. And it was really interesting. And when I saw Marla Spivak uh, this week, because you know, talking to a fellow beekeeper um, and YouTuber like you, you know, we're we're very similar on the wavelength, humor. But I'm always really nervous when I meet somebody like that. So I was a lot more reserved at first because, you know, this is one of the researchers that I've listened to since I was a teenager, and I don't want to act like a complete moron. And so we got to talking, and 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 Marla was uh, very enjoyable to talk to. I'm super excited uh, to see her, and again, and and for other people to get to meet her. And the information she provided was great, but um, she asked a few things about me, and eventually I, I started talking about how I do my presentations whenever I go speak at, like, say, North Carolina, West Virginia, California, wherever I'm at. I, I have a strategy, and I usually find somebody that I know in the crowd, and thankfully because of the YouTube, but it's not too hard. And so when I was in West Virginia, I discovered this tra- strategy a, a while back, and that's where Larry and Mary Ann Sears, and they're, they're just a great, sweet couple. They're older, but they don't act like it. They, they really don't act their age at all, especially Larry. He acts like he's about 10 years old. And so, but everybody knows and loves Larry and Mary Ann Sears. And so my strategy, and I, I, I talked about this, I'm like, you know, people really have a hard time concentrating for more than about 10 to 15 minutes at a time. So I, I try to throw jokes in there, and one of the jokes I always plan on is whenever I go to this event, I'll find somebody that ever, most everybody knows, and I also know that person can take a joke, and then I'm going to pick on that person the entire event and make fun of them, and so she's like, really? And she, Marla's just sitting there like the professional that she is and just nodding like, that. hmm, I, I could see where that could break the ice, um, and she just absorbs it, and I'm thinking, she probably thinks that's the dumbest thing she's heard all year. So the next day, she gives her presentation, and she works me into it and roasts me in her presentation. <laughs> and she's like, I learned that one from Cayman, and um, I absolutely loved it. It was great. So that hey, was a little bit day. of a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was a little bit of a rabbit trail there. Sorry. Um, so, Richard, um, we've got... Uh, a lot of stuff covered tonight, and I want to just say a massive thank you to everyone who has come on. I want to say a huge thank you to you, Richard, because that was a great presentation. For any of you who, who came on late, uh, please go back and watch that. If you're wanting to know about these new hornets, the yellow-legged hornet that have come into Georgia, they are not like the European hornets. They're not like the Japanese hornets that were out in the West. Richard's got a great presentation on how they deal with them and their a French environment and what kind of traps and various things. How we try, how we try to deal with them. How we try. Yeah, how we try. That's probably a better, uh, we do deal with them, but it's all my colleagues I speak to always say, oh, these damn hornets this year, they're a pain or (laughs) it's another thing we don't want. You know, we know we're all beekeepers. There's so many things we have. This is the thing we don't want. Mm. And, And, you you know, so I, Exactly. I hope we can squash it. And if, but if we do have to deal with it, at least we'll be able to start with a head start because of your information. So we'll be uh, talking to you in the future, Richard. Thank you. If you need, if you have anything to share in the future in a video, let me know. I'll share it. And we look forward to seeing you here in a hundred and like forty something days. Or I know it's crazy. Time is ticking away quick. It is it's moving away quick, and we're going to have all kinds of information in the comments of this video so everyone thanks for coming on we'll see you in the next video richard thanks so much sir thanks everybody for being such a great audience and also it's been brilliant being on Cayman, you're such a great guy we always have a lot of fun i just love coming on because it's so relaxed and we're all just doing that community and sharing so uh, keep supporting everybody out there thank you um, it's really important because there's so much to gain from everybody it doesn't matter whether you're big small everybody's got something to give so on that note, I'll uh, say goodbye from Brittany. Take care. I'm off to bed. It's uh, half past one in the morning. <laughs> uh, bless your heart. Thanks, Richard. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. Bye. Bye, Cayman. Bye-bye.